Hello kiddos, welcome back to our Holy Week Children's Sermon Series. Um, as you join on, go ahead and let me know that you're here if you can. I'm not going to wait um, a super long time for people to join us today like I have before uh, because this Children's Sermon is actually going to be pretty long. Um, I'm going to recap the days of the Holy Week that we've missed for you all and then we'll discuss what Monday Thursday is. So um, as you join us, just let me know. Um, I'm going to say a blanket hello to everyone right now. And I'm going to type it in for everyone to see. Um, and then we'll get started, okay? It is really hard to type when uh, you know people are watching you. <laughs> Does anybody else have that problem or is it just me? Who else is excited that we finally have some sunshine outside? I feel like it's been a very overcast and gloomy um, week for us here. Hey Miss Peg and Anakin if you're there. And Steven and Mr. Dave. I hope you all are having a great week. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you were able to catch my Palm Sunday children's sermon, um, that's awesome. If you haven't been able to watch it, I do suggest you go back and, um, and view it. It actually talks about a lot about why the Gospels vary from each other. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and um, why they don't match up completely. And that's because um, they're written by different authors, right? So it talks about that sort of stuff, and it gives a detailed account of what Palm Sunday is and what it means to us as Christians. So if you have a chance to go back and view that, if you haven't already, I suggest you do that. Today we're gonna be talking about Monday Thursday, which is a, a really weird name. Um, there's our grandfather clock. It's three o'clock. Um, Monday is a really weird name, and I'll, I promise, boys and girls, I will tell you what that means later. But at first, I wanted to recap what happens between Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday. There's a couple of days in there that we haven't talked about. So, um, on we talk about Palm Sunday, which is when Jesus enters to Jerusalem as king, um, and he's celebrated as a king. It's a big day of celebration and festival. It's kind of like Fiesta here in San Antonio. It's kind of a, a big party day, and he's recognized as king. Um, but in typical style for um, for Jesus, that doesn't last very long. As he's entering, um, hi Miss Debbie. As he's entering Jerusalem, uh, the leaders of the church are getting mad at him. They're getting mad at be celebrating, and there's this undertone of of um, sort of bad stuff to come. So um, on Monday, after Palm Sunday. Um, on Monday, Jesus enters into Jerusalem again. He's not staying the night in Jerusalem. It's commonly believed that Jesus, at the end of the night during Holy Week, during this Passover festival, that he goes out into Bethany and stays in the house of Bethany, which would have been the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So he's staying with his friends. Um, but he goes back in on Monday, and he goes to the Temple of Jerusalem. And um, the Temple of Jerusalem was a massive temple, and it was meant to be um, sort of a, the center of Jewish faith. And it was supposed to be a place for everybody to enter into and everybody to pray at. And over the generations, um, that openness went away. And um, Jesus goes in there to pray. It was for men, so he goes in as a man to pray and um, sees money changers in the temple. Now, boys and girls, money changers were people who were basically selling forgiveness. You could think of it that way. Um, there were a whole lot of um, laws that existed during Jesus' time to pay for your sin. Now, the payment for sin is death, and it has always been death, and it will always be death. But in Jesus' time, before he died on the cross to pay for our sins, the way that people would pay for their sins would be to, um, to sacrifice a pure animal in their place. 
So basically that pure animal took on their sins and died for them. And so the money changers in the temple had set up a whole, um, a whole uh, system where um, you were not allowed to bring in your own animal to sacrifice to the temple to atone for your sins. You had to purchase an animal there. But you could not bring in your money to purchase an animal there because the money you used around the city was unclean. So you would have to, in order to atone for your sins, in order to pay for your sins, the things you did wrong, you would have to bring your outside money into the temple and exchange it for temple money. Um, and then you'd have to go and pay for a temple animal to sacrifice before you could go on and actually perform the religious rites you needed to do and, and sacrifice that animal. And um, none of that was equal. So if I brought in, um, let's say $8 of outside un unclean money to the temple so I could sacrifice an animal, I would have to exchange it for temple money. And it was temple money. It was different. I would exchange it for the temple money. And I would maybe take those $8 and maybe get $4 back. Probably more like three fifty. There, It was not an uh, even exchange. And then I would have to go and purchase the animal that I needed to sacrifice to pay for my sins. And that was another markup because these were clean and purified animals. So they cost more than the animals you could get outside of the temple. So it became... This temple that God created for everybody to go to to worship him became a big money-making pro you know, process. And when Jesus saw that, he got mad. He got angry. And he flipped over their tables and he threw them out of the temple. And he called them a brood of vipers. He referred to them as snakes because they were being so evil. And if, if you remember the story of the Garden of Eden, it's the snake, the serpent, who tricks Adam and Eve into eating the fruit. So that's a pretty big insult to throw at somebody um, who is very deep in, in their faith. So that's what happens on Monday. He makes a big scene on Monday. And then on Tuesday of Holy Week, Jesus goes back into town and he goes back to the temple of Jerusalem and um, he starts to teach. And as he's teaching, he of course gathers a crowd because that's what happens every time Jesus, is, Jesus teaches. And um, because he's inside the temple and because he's inside the city of Jerusalem, that crowd happens to involve um, the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who are in charge of Jewish law. And they're listening to Jesus preach and they're already mad at him, right? He comes in announced as king. And when they tell him to tell his people to stop calling him king, he pretty much tells them, get over it. It's going to happen because if they don't call me king, the stones will cry out and call me king. And then the next day he comes in and he throws the money changers out. So the, the chief priests are already mad at Jesus and they're looking at a way to get rid of him. And as he's teaching, they decide, we're going to try to trip him up. We're going to try to figure out a way to get him in trouble. So they start to ask him questions. And it's in this process that we get some of the um, bigger sort of verses that you hear about in Christianity. There's some that like John 3 16 that most people who aren't Christians have heard at least once in their life. And there's a couple of other ones that maybe you don't know where they came from, but you've heard them. And that's where some of these come from. So um, the Sadducees start talking to Jesus and they ask him about taxes, which is not something that anybody likes to pay. Taxes are money that you pay to the government that you live in um, for services the government provides for you. So the, the Sadducees asked Jesus, um, should we pay our taxes? Because they know if Jesus says, no, don't pay your taxes, then they can get him arrested because he's refusing to pay taxes to his government, refusing to pay to the emperor of Rome, Caesar. Um, they, and they also know that if he says, yes, you should pay your taxes, that the crowd that's gathered is going to get mad at him because they don't like to pay their taxes. And boys and girls, I hate to break it to you, but pretty much no one likes to pay taxes. It's not fun to work and have to pay money to your government, but it's a fact of life. And it was the same then as it is now. Nobody likes to pay taxes. So they ask him, what do we do? Are we supposed to pay taxes or not? And uh, Jesus responds. You can find his response both in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12. He says, give unto Caesar what's Caesar's and then give unto God what is God's. And what he's saying there is um, Caesar was the leader of Rome. So he was the leader of the, the government that Jesus was in. He, you could think of him as our president. And he's saying, you should pay the government that you live in, the taxes you owe them. 
right? That is part of being a citizen of a nation. You pay taxes. And at the same time, you should be tithing to God. The money that you're giving to the government or what you're doing for the government to pay taxes and what you're doing to God for God to for tithing, it's not the same thing. And they don't conflict with each other in any way. It is okay to do both taxes and tithing. You can still be a Christian and do both. And um, the Sadducees were kind of like, man, how did he figure that one out? What are we going to do now? So then the Pharisees uh, take over and they decide they're going to try to trip up Jesus by asking about the Ten Commandments. Let's ask about law, you know, about Jewish law. Let's ask about our faith and see what he says about that. So they ask him, what is the greatest of the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses? Which is the one that we should follow the most and focus on the most? And they know that if Jesus picks any one of the ten, any single one of them, that they can then nitpick his argument and, and tear it apart and get people upset with him because in reality, no commandment is greater than the other. And so Jesus, being Jesus again, gives a middle-of-the-road answer. And he gives one that they're not expecting. And he says, what we now call the greatest commandment, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. That is the greatest commandment. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't pick from the 10. He goes back and he summarizes the entire law and prophets. Um, he, he summarizes the entire, what we call the Old Testament or the original five books of the Bible, the Torah. And he puts it into two verses and it really stumps them because he didn't pick one of the 10 like they expected. They wanted to be able to tear them apart. So there's a couple of other things that happen on um on that on Tuesday in Holy Week that um, we get really cool passages out of. He talks about marriage and divorce. He also happens to predict his death, which he does many times, but he predicts his death very specifically on this day. And he says, this is the date and the time that I'm going to die. Um, so it's, it's kind of a busy day, but it's not a day that we hold services for. So it's not a day that, while it pertains to our faith, it's not a day that we worship necessarily on. Um, and then Wednesday of Holy Week would be what um, is actually sometimes referred to as Silent Wednesday. There's not a whole lot in scripture that happens on that Wednesday. We can assume that people were pre pre um, preparing, the other P word, preparing for the Passover feast that's about to happen. The Passover will be happening on Thursday today, Monday, Thursday. But um, it's not really mentioned. What is commonly thought of happening on Wednesday is Judas agreeing to betray Jesus for money. He goes to the high priest or the priests seek him out and they say, we want to take this guy down. We'll pay you to do it. Can you, can you rat him out to us? So generally um, Wednesday is thought of as a day that Judas agrees to pay, to, um, to betray Jesus for money. So I'm going to start talking about Holy Thursday or Monday, Thursday. That was all my summary. I'm sorry. I promise it'll be shorter tomorrow when we talk about Good Friday. But um, I'm going to start talking about Monday, Thursday, boys and girls. So if you have wiggles, get them out right now because I've already been talking for a while. Um, grab a snack. Uh, Monday, Thursday actually has two parts of it that we're going to talk about. And um, it's funny. Uh, name comes from the word mandatum in Latin, which actually means command or mandate. Um, you could think of those two big words as meaning a law. We know what a law is. It's a rule. It's a rule for living in a certain area. And when somebody in charge, like the president, gives a law, they're giving a mandate. They're giving a command. So that's where we get the name Monday Thursday up from. It's that shortened version of mandatum. And um, the command that Jesus gives us is actually found in the book of John, uh, verse or chapter 13, verse 15. <laughs> um, but we're going to first talk about the Monday Thursday story as it's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, because John differs. It tells a different story. And remember, we talked about in Palm Sunday that the gospel authors wrote the gospels for different reasons. And that's why they differ from each other. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I'm going to summarize it for you. But you can find the Monday Thursday story in Matthew chapter 26, in Mark chapter 14, and in Luke chapter 22. And in each one of those instances, it's about 40 verses. So it's a long scripture passage. So I, I thought it would be easier if I um, sort of summarize it and give notes at the same time, because we're talking about why we uh, worship on this day, why it's important to our faith. And it's not necessarily my normal children's sermon, 
Um, if you are an older kiddo out there, I really suggest that you crack open your Bible. I know you all know how to do it. Um, and get into it and read it yourself. If you are up for reading all of the different versions, I think it's fantastic because they all do give a different, a slightly different account and a different view on the day. Um, everything I'm giving you, it comes out of our eventual Bible that we use in church. So you can follow right along with that. Um, it is the NIV version for the grown-ups out there. If you're a little, I would suggest that you ask your moms and dads to read it for you. The uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version of Monday Thursday is much shorter than John's. So we're going to start with that. Um, I have my uh, note cards from Becky's Brainy Boutique from Teachers Pay Teachers to use for visuals for you guys. So it's not um, just Miss Jessie's face on screen. <laughs> and um, But I'm not reading from the cards. I'm just going to summarize it from the notes that I've taken straight from Scripture. So... Um, all three passages start with Jesus sending some disciples into Jerusalem to find a place for them to have Passover, to have their Passover feast. And um, all three of them, actually, um, they uh, talk about Jesus giving specific instructions on where they're going to find a place for Passover. Just like Jesus did in the Palm Sunday story, saying this is the place where you will find a donkey and her colt. And this is what you're supposed to say to the people when you need to take them. He does that with Passover. He says, go to Jerusalem and find the man who's carrying a water jug, um, a water jug at the gate and ask him for a room to have our Passover feast. He'll take you there. And then I want you to start preparing our, our meal together. So the disciples do that. It's, um, it's funny when you're reading the, the passages together side by side through the different gospels, they get more specific as they go on. So in Matthew, it actually says that Jesus sent some disciples to prepare for the Passover feast. And um, Mark, it says he sent a couple of disciples, so like two, to prepare, prepare the feast. And then in Luke, it says he sent John and Peter to um, prepare the feast. And the differences of that might come in the fact that um, Luke was a student of Peter, so he got a direct account from Peter when he wrote the story. And um, Matthew and... And Mark, uh, Mark got his account from Paul, and Matthew wrote the account himself, having been a disciple. So they might not have remembered who it was. They just remember two people leaving. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of an interesting point. But they all go. They go and they prepare for the meal. And then um, later that night, all of the disciples gather for their Passover meal. This is that iconic Last Supper thing that we see everywhere where the 12 disciples and Jesus are sitting around the table. Jesus is right in the middle there with his awesome, epic, flowing hair and beard. And um, before the meal starts, in both Matthew and Mark, before the meal starts, Jesus predicts that one of them is going to betray him. Now, Luke predicts it also, but he actually predicts it during the meal. But they all say the same thing. They predict that somebody is going to betray him, and they say the person... Um, who dips his hand in the bowl with me is going to be the one to betray me. No, they're eating their Passover meal. And as we'll find out in just a couple of minutes, they're eating bread and wine and they're dipping the bread into the wine. So he's not actually sticking his hand in a bowl of like wine or water. He's dipping the bread into the wine. And Jesus is pointing out directly that it is Judas in each instance that is going to betray him. Um, then Jesus picks up the bread and he breaks the bread and he tells them, this is my body take and eat it. And in the same way, then he then picks up the cup of wine and he says, this is my, this is the blood of the covenant for the forgiveness of sins or for the forgiveness of many. The words vary slightly, but they all say one really important word. And that word is covenant. Boys and girls, if you remember our studies we've done before, covenant means promise. This is our promise to you. And when God and Jesus make a promise, it is forever. If you remember the story of Noah's Ark, God made a covenant with the earth after Noah's Ark landed after the great flood. And he put a rainbow up in the sky and he said, I will never, ever flood the earth again. That is my covenant to you. And he's kept that promise. There has never been another great flood. Um, Jesus is that makes a lot of covenants with us. In fact, his death is a covenant with us. But this is one that we do every single um, month. This is where we get communion from. And the words are very similar because they come straight from scripture. You know, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, this is the blood of the covenant shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
He's saying, I make this promise for you. I am giving you my body and my blood as a promise to you. And you need to remember that in your Christian faith. So then after he does that, he gets to um, do something that I imagine Jesus didn't like doing. You know, he was with the 12 disciples pretty much all the time. They kind of worked like brothers. I'm, I'm thinking of a band of brothers that were always together, traveling together. And the next part comes and he tells them, all of them, that they're going to betray him. They're going to fall away from him before the night is over. But in, in a, a very specific way, he calls out Peter, his rock, the guy that's with him all the time. He calls out Peter and he says, Peter, before this night is through, you are going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning to signify a new day. You're going to deny me three times. And the wording for that is actually very consistent across the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Luke says that before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me. But either way, it's, it's the three times before the rooster crows. What does a rooster sound like boys and girls? They go cock a doodle doo, right? As the sun comes up in the morning. Um, they're, they were like ancient alarm clocks. So Jesus is saying to Peter, right after we've shared this very intimate meal together, and after we've had all of this friendship together, that I know before the night's gone, you're going to betray me. And I think that probably really hurt Peter. He gets all upset about it, and he, he says, no, not me, Lord. But we have to remember, Jesus knew what was happening. Even if the disciples didn't understand it, Jesus did. And I think that sometimes Jesus did things to prepare the disciples, and we might not think of it that way. Maybe he's, we think of it more as he's calling them out. Like when he said, Judas, you're going to betray me. And now he's saying, Peter, you're going to deny me. But I almost think that it might have been more like a dad saying, this is what's going to happen. And I want you to be ready for it. You know, it's, you can't stop it. It's going to happen. So let's figure out a way that we can handle it. He's given him a heads up almost. Um, so after the meal and after he talks about Peter's denial, he takes... Um, Peter, James, and John, his, his three closest friends, his three closest disciples, to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And um, his heart's heavy. He tells them, I need you to stay awake and pray for me. I need you to stand guard. And I'm going to go over there and I'm going to pray. So he separates from the group and he's praying to God. And we get um, another one of those really famous scriptures that we hear a lot. And he says, he says, God, my, my soul is hurting. I'm scared about what's coming because we have to remember that even though Jesus was the son of God and he was fully God, he knew what was going to happen. He knew the entire plan. He was also fully human. And he, even though he knew the entire plan, he knew the pain and the suffering he was going to go through before it even happened. I mean, he knew it his entire life. And I have to imagine that was like a cloud hanging over his head. Um, and if it were me knowing that I'm going to go through this big pain and suffering, this huge, horrendous ordeal, I would be doing everything I possibly could to figure out a way to get out of it. And so Jesus is praying this prayer. And he says, take this cup from me, Lord. I don't want to go through this. But at the same time, God, I want to follow your will, not mine. So if it's your will that I go through it, I'll do it. And he's in this really heavy emotional state. And he goes back three different times to see his disciples. And they're sleeping sleeping on the garden, sleeping on the ground, three different times. He has to wake him up and said, I asked you to pray for me. And you can't do that. You can't, you can't stay away from temptation to sleep. You get, you've fallen asleep instead of praying. And the more I read this, the more I get into these scriptures, I have to feel like this is the first betrayal. This is the first denial of Jesus right here. That's happening. His three best friends, the guys who had been with him through so much, couldn't stay awake and pray with him when he was obviously in distress, when he was obviously having a hard time. They couldn't stay up and pray with him. Um, the passage in Luke um, actually goes through the entire prayer before Jesus goes back and finds them asleep. But the fact that the disciples were sleeping is consistent in all three books. And then, and then Judas shows up with the soldiers at the garden. And um, Jesus called to the disciples right before that happened. He said, get up, the time has come. The time has come. It's happening now. And I don't know if the disciples woke up right away to Jesus's voice or if they woke up when they heard this crowd coming. 
But Judas approaches Jesus. He had told the soldiers he would indicate who to arrest with his greeting. So he walks up to Jesus and he calls him rabbi, which means teacher. And it was a very personal greeting from Judas to Jesus. They had, they had been brothers. They had been living together, eating together, doing everything together. And he goes up and he kisses him on the cheek and in, in a greeting and steps away so the soldiers can arrest them. And the disciples jump up to defend Jesus. And it's, it says that one of them drew a sword. It's named as Peter in one of the Gospels. And I'm sorry, I forgot to make a note of which one. But one of the disciples pulls a sword. And he uh, slices off the ear of a servant of the high, a high priest, a servant of Caiaphas. And Jesus says, enough. Don't be violent on my account. That's not okay. That's not what I've taught you to do. And in one of the... Um, in Luke, it actually says that Jesus healed the man's ear and made it whole again. Uh, but this is where our story of Monday Thursday is actually going to end, is with Jesus' arrest. Um, I did want to go through and point out differences that happen in the book of John. Um, because John's uh, gospel is different. Like I've said before, it focuses on the character of Jesus. So he... Um, has a really long retelling of Monday Thursday. It is actually John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and the first part of 18 are all Monday Thursday. Um, so I really was not going to read that on um, here because we would be here until probably about 6 p.m. But uh, it starts off with the Passover meal. It starts off in the middle of the Passover meal with all the disciples gathered together. And um, during this part, while they're eating the bread, Jesus gets up and he wraps a towel around his waist. And then he goes and grabs a bowl of water and he walks around to each and every single one of his disciples. And he starts to wash their feet all the way around the table to all 12. Even Judas, even though he knew what was going to happen, he washes all of their feet. Now, boys and girls, that probably seems like a weird thing for us today to go around and wash people's feet. But if you've remembered some of my children's sermons I've given before about Monday Thursday, um, foot washing was something that was done in ancient culture, especially in ancient Roman culture and ancient Jew Jewish culture, because they did not have paved roads. So they had dirt roads and they wore sandals. So if you're on a dirt road and you're wearing sandals and you live in a des desert and it's windy and gusty out, um, your feet are going to get dirty. I mean, if you wear sandals here in Texas, in San Antonio, your feet get dirty wearing them. So they would enter a house and it was customary to provide a bowl of water and a towel, a clean towel, to clean off the road dust from your feet. That was a normal thing to do. And I'm not sure why in this instance it wasn't done before the meal. But um, either way, Jesus stops in the middle of the meal and he starts to perform this task. Now, I want you all to think about um, there was no paved roads. There were also no cars, boys and girls, which means that um, they used animals. They either used their own two feet that God gave them or they used animals as transport. And when you use animals as transport, like we talked about with Palm Sunday and laying the branches on the road, um, Animals go poop, right? And so the road is covered in animal poop. And when it rains, it gets smeared everywhere. And it's gross, right? It would be gross. And so when Jesus is, is kneeling down to serve his disciples, he's, he's doing a job that a servant would do. And um, it's important for us to remember this because he gives a command during it. He's kneeling down. He's not greeting them eye to eye. He's kneeling down below them. And he's cleaning their feet, this gross, dirty job that a servant is supposed to do. But he's their teacher. And they call him master, right? And they all get upset at Jesus doing it. And he, his response is just kind of heartbreaking and beautiful all in one. He says, you know, you're right to call me teacher. You're right to call me master because that's who I am. But if I can serve you this way, if I can get down on my hands and knees and I can clean clean you, make you whole, make you pure, you can do the same for other people. There is no excuse for you not to serve other people. And so this is where we get the mandate of um, Monday Thursday from is in chapter 13, verse 15. He says, I have set an example for you that you should do as I have done to you, meaning I have served you 
And if you look at both of these stories, Jesus serves the Last Supper, right? He serves that Passover meal to his disciples. He passes it around the table. And then he goes and he does this, this foot washing in John's retelling. And he's, he's washing and cleaning their feet. In both instances, he is serving them. He is helping them. He is working for them. And he's giving us this mandate that we should go do likewise. We should be serving others, not ourselves. But the story picks up the same way. Um, Jesus then predicts uh, Judas's betrayal. And in this instance, um, they're sitting around the table and he takes a piece of bread and he dunks it in the wine and he hands it to Judas. And John very specifically says that the devil entered Judas in that moment and took over. So you could call it what you want to. You could say that Judas gave in to Jesus. You could say that that Judas, or to the devil, you can say that Judas was evil. However you want to look at it, the plan was set in motion. Um, whether G Judas had control of what was happening or not, the plan was in motion and it was going to happen. Um, and then Jesus also predicts Peter's denial, exactly like the other three Gospels. Um, John says that you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows, just like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then John goes off on this huge tangent. Um, chapters 14 through 16 are Jesus sitting in the upper room talking with his disciples and he is comforting them about what's going to come up. He says, I've got to leave you and prepare a place for you, but you're going to be okay. He tells them that he is the way to the father. Nobody gets to the father except through the son. So you have to have a relationship with me in order to get to the father. He promises them the Holy Spirit. And I love this passage of scripture because he calls the Holy Spirit, the comforter. I'm going to send the comforter to be with you. And he's going to care for you. He's going to live with you until I can return. He also tells the parable of the vine and the branches. And then he tries to prep his disciples for what's going to come. He tells them that they're going to be hated after this week, after the Holy Week is complete. He's not calling it Holy Week, obviously. That's what we call it. But he says, after this is completed, you're going to be hated. You're going to, nobody's going to like you. Nobody's going to want to be around you. It's going to be a really hard time. So be ready. Then he also says, that the Holy Spirit is going to be there with them. It's going to be living with them. So not to be afraid, it's coming. Like I said, the comforter will be there and it will spread from you to other people. And that in that way, your grief that you're, you're going to feel very quickly is going to turn to joy. So he's, he's preparing them. And then he goes off and he prays. But he's not praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not the same prayers that are done in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He does this huge prayer, all of chapter 17 in John is a prayer where he prays that um, he may be glorified through what's about to come, the, the trial that he's about to do, that he, he prays for his disciples and about what they're about to face, and then he prays for all believers in the entire world and what they are going to face. And then after that's all done, he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane, like it's recorded in the other Gospels. And um, it's short, it sounds like it's very short after he gets there that um, Judas arrives with the soldiers to arrest Jesus. And he again says that Peter gets angry and tries to defend Jesus and cuts off the ear of the servant of Caiaphas. And then Jesus heals it and makes it whole again before he's taken away. And uh, boys and girls, we will, we will pick up what happens to Jesus tomorrow um, in our Good Friday sermon and his trial and all of that. It's kind of Hard to tell in a way what part of his trial takes place on Monday, Thursday, and what part actually takes place on Good Friday. But the theme of Monday, Thursday, and the reason why we celebrate Monday, Thursday, is um, to remind us of our job, of this commandment, this mandate that Jesus gave us to serve others as he served us. So I want you all to think about Monday, Monday Thursday as being a um, our day that we honor and respect Jesus's commandment to serve. It's a day of service. It's a day of reflection on ways that we can do it because whether you are two year old, two years old, oh my gosh, I can't talk anymore, or you're 102, there is some way that you can serve other people around you. There is some way that you can expand the kingdom of heaven and glorify God. Um, and it's just a matter of finding that way and finding you know, what your time and your talents can do for the kingdom of God when you give them back to him. So boys and girls, let's say a, a quick prayer. I know I've been talking forever and a day, and I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then moms and dads, of course, I've got some links for you. So boys and girls, let's bow our heads, fold our hands, close our eyes, and say, Dear Jesus, help us to focus this day on serving others as you also served. 
In your name we pray. Amen. So moms and dads, I promise my Good Friday story is not going to be as long because I don't have to recap the beginning of the week like I did here. Um, but I do have some things for you to do. Most of Monday, Thursday craft ideas and activity ideas all focus on having a Passover meal together. So, you know, if you have flatbreads or ways that you could um, recreate that, you can Google what a Passover meal involves and, and redo that with your children. Um, there's some crafts like recreating a, a picture of it that you can do. I just drew that on construction paper and um, stuck it to the wall. They also um, focus on foot washing, cleaning of each other's feet and serving in that way. I think that is highly impactful for our older kids that um, are able to bathe themselves on their own, if I can say it that way. They don't have mom and dad helping them bathe anymore because it's probably more uncomfortable for them. I mean, I think if I think about how uncomfortable it is for me to have somebody else touching my feet because I'm used to bathing them myself, it's gonna be the same for somebody who has developed modesty and isn't showering and bathing on their own. So it's probably something that's bigger for our older kids. Um, but our younger kids love doing it too and they, of course, love playing in water. So it's a great activity for the whole family. I'm gonna drop some links for you. Um, the first one will be from Catholic Toolbox. They actually have a huge listing of um, Holy Week crafts and activities and ideas that you can do if you wanna pull stuff out of there. Um, they've compiled it from all over the internet and I have actually used Catholic Toolbox many times in my um, children's ministry. And sometimes I do have to change it to make sure that it's, it matches our Methodist beliefs, but they have fantastic ideas. And they also have a bunch of file folder games that you can print out and play like a board game that are awesome. The kids love doing them. Um, the second one that I'll drop is actually from Annette Frazier on Teachers Pay Teachers. And she's got a freebie where you can do sequencing cards. You can print it out and have your kids cut out the pictures and color them and put them in order according to the Easter story. You do have to read the scripture to do it. It's not on there. There's also an older kid version where they can just draw the pictures in after they've read the Easter story. And if you have kiddos who are very hands-on and like to build things and you have Legos laying around, there is an awesome Holy Week activity available on Teachers Pay Teachers from Jennifer uh, Lugardo. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. I printed out in black and white here, but it's called Building Jerusalem. And it goes through all of Holy Week. I wish I had found this on Palm Sunday because I would have told you about it then. But it goes through all of Holy Week and it talks about the scriptures. It gives you the scriptures for each day. And then you build a section of Jerusalem for every single day out of Legos. And they tell you how to build it. She actually has a picture of a completed um, building on there. And um, it looks awesome. Uh, if I actually had Legos at home and not Duplos, I might be doing this myself because I think it's a fantastic way to visually make the story come alive for your little ones. So I will be dropping those for you. I will also be back here tomorrow at three o'clock to talk about um, Good Friday and what that means to our faith. Uh, I know this is long for our little ones. And Anakin, I saw that you said hi forever ago. I'm sorry I said hi to you before I started, before your dad got on. But um, I missed you all and I'm so glad that you all are joining and I hope that you're getting out as much out of it as I am researching why we do these things. Um, I know these aren't my typical children's sermons where I'm giving a message about shining your light and being a hope and sharing God's kindness. But I do think it's very important for our kiddos to know the whys of what we do. Why is this important to our Christian faith? And, and the bottom line for Monday Thursday is because Jesus taught us to serve. Jesus taught us to love and he taught us to serve. And if we are not doing those two things, then we're not fulfilling our covenant with him. So um, I will see you all tomorrow. And until then, stay safe, stay well, and have happy quarantine.